All right, we have a big panel of speakers, so I will not introduce all of them. Instead, I will simply invite our moderator to come up and he will in invite this panelist. Our moderator today is Dr. Julian Huppert, Director, Intellectual Forum at Jesus College, Cambridge University. Good afternoon, everybody, and it's great to be here as your post-lunch entertainment while you digest the food. Uh, it's been an amazing morning talking about all sorts of ideas, uh, whether it's about technology, about how government can work. What we're going to do now with this fantastic panel is look at how you can actually involve the educators, whether they're teachers uh, or students, uh, because they have to be at the heart of whatever we do. It's been said... If you take a classroom and put 30 laptops in without changing anything else, all you've done is make education more expensive. So we're mostly going to hear just from, from this rather large but wonderful multi-talented panel. <laughs> so at the far end, we have uh, Dennis Litsky, who's a radical educator, who's established College Unbound, Met School, Big Picture Learning. Um, he's not afraid to be quite controversial, as you will see later on. Um, he's been fired, I think, twice so far. Um, but the last time they made a major film out of it, so he's clearly doing something right. Um, moving on, we then have David Weston, uh, who is a maths and science teacher and now runs the Teacher Development Trust and advises the UK government on what we should do uh, for teachers. He also has many skills and has both taught and competed in international ballroom and Latin American dancing. So if you cheer loudly enough, he will demonstrate and give lessons afterwards. <laughs> um, we then move on to uh, uh, Pak Ti Ung, um, who trains school leaders in Singapore. And indeed, so many school leaders have been trained by him that he's now taught most of the principals in the entire country. Uh, just imagine that, that for impact and making a difference. Um, and his book, Learning from Singapore, The Power of Paradoxes, is, is available and, and very good. We then move to Cathy Seeley, who's a UK mathematics educator at pretty much every single level, from elementary through to, to secondary, at local, state, national. Um, she also has a varied background, so spent the millennium in Ugadugu uh, when she was teaching in Burkina Faso, so can compare one developed country to another. And then finally, we have Sagata Mitra, who is a professor of education technology at the University of Newcastle, won the 2013 TED Award, uh, and is the real pioneer of School in the Cloud. And he is also a film star with a School in the Cloud film uh, out now. One of his big challenges, as somebody who celebrates self-directed learning, is pupils constantly asking, why do you get paid if we have to do all the work? <laughs> so that's the panel. We are very tight on time, so we'll ask you all to be brief, and I will be rude and abrupt if I have to be. Um, but if I can start at the far end and work this way for what you think are the key messages that our audience uh, should know from your work and your thoughts in under two minutes. And I will try and take questions from the audience, so please do start putting some in. Dennis, okay, over to you. Thank you. Um, for me, everything starts from the students. Doesn't matter if you're eight years old, if you're 18, or if you're 38. Uh, I have uh, 150 high schools and elementary schools around the world and just started a college. And my schools are based on students' interests and passions. So you find their interests, you find their passion, you give them mentors, you put them out in the community, and then you study very deeply. And what I care most about is the skills that people were talking about today, the problem solving, the creativity. That's what I care about. And everyone's curriculum is different because they have a different interest. And uh, every 10 weeks they have to present on their work and I say to them, I want to see a passion, because that's what learning is about. I want to see growth. And I go, no bull, because I don't want you to just tell me about what you read, because I read it also. So <laughs> a, a couple examples. I had a young man come into my office, said he wanted to study the Vietnam War, and I didn't know why. And it turned out his dad was in the, in the Army, uh, wouldn't talk to his boy about the war, and his his son thought he had different opinions. And the boy studied it, he took college classes, he had a mentorship building a memorial. And then uh, I finally asked him, Joe, why are you so interested? 
and he said his dad would never speak with him about the war. And for Joe's senior project, he took his dad back to Vietnam. Oh, wow. And together, and then he did a website, How to Talk About the War. And so I didn't care that Joe didn't know about a lot of wars. I cared that he studied something very deeply. And he went on to be a history major in college and come back and teach in our school. And yeah. so if you keep finding that interest, I had a 43-year-old man come into my college, just got out of prison. Uh, he wasn't going to just take little courses. He wanted to rebuild his community. And so every course he took connected to that. So people talk a lot about deeper learning. And it's not about how tough your curriculum is. It's really how engaged you are. When people are engaged, they go deep, deep, deep. And Thank you. My, oh, you got me. All right. <laughs> the last thing I want to say is, <laughs> is this is a social justice issue. And I've turned Nike's words from just do it to do it just. Okay. Thank you very much, David. I owe you 10 seconds. <laughs> 37, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so once upon a time, I was a teacher, and I spent 10 years as a teacher, and they were 10 of the most amazing years of my life, but they were also 10 of the most frustrating years of my life as well. Because as a teacher, you constantly get these fantastic stories of children coming to you and saying, you helped me achieve something I never thought I could achieve. You helped me overcome barriers I never thought I could overcome. But you will always meet children who you think, I couldn't quite help you enough. I didn't help you this year. I didn't quite help you reach what you needed to reach. I didn't quite help you understand what you needed to understand. And the only thing that keeps you in teaching is the idea that maybe next year I'll figure out a way to help that student. Mm -hmm. So here's the challenge for us. In too many schools, we see teachers who are not improving. They're not developing. Next year, they're going to be only as effective as they are this year. So my organization, after 10 years in teaching, I set up a nonprofit called the Teacher Development Trust. And our mission is how do we change schools so that every teacher, every educator can be better next year than they are this year? Because if we can harness the collective intelligence and the best minds and the best evidence in the world and focus on helping every teacher get better, you help one teacher get better, you help 100 students get better, and not just for that year, but for every year. So my, focus, my question to you is, how do we not just focus on one student and technology for students and innovation and architecture for students, how can we be just as smart about helping teachers learn and develop as we are for students? Thank you very much. Uh, Pakti, over to you. My main message will be for teachers to teach less, learn more. What I mean to say is this, if we teach less but teach better, mm -hmm. students will learn more and learn better. So since this is lunchtime, perhaps this analogy may work. We talk to teachers a lot about technology. Now, that is important. The world is changing. We need to keep up with the times. But basically, teaching and learning is a bit like that. It's just like mother feeding food to the child. This is teaching, teaching, teaching. On this side, the child has to eat and eat and eat. That's called learning, learning, and learning. The problem in many classrooms is this. The good conscientious teacher take the food and feed and feed and feed. The child says, I do not want to eat, I do not want to eat, I do not want to eat. And the challenge to the teacher is this, so what do you do? So most teachers got into the state of getting more and more angry, more and more upset, and what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? So I just get angry, upset, anxious, and stuff it down your throat, stuff it down your throat, stuff it down your throat. That is teach more and learn less. So we ask teachers, why don't you reflect? Why don't you look at the food, taste the food that you are producing, that you're cooking? If we cook a really good palatable dish that's easy to digest, palatable, children will want to eat and at good reasonable pace. Let's teach less so that our children will learn more. That's my main message. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I, I wonder what your example would have been if we were in a different time of day, but we'll have to invite you back sometime. Uh, Kathy, over to you. Well, I think I will be echoing what many of the philosophies up here are, and that is that when I learned to teach mathematics many years ago, we were taught to tell students rules, to explain, explain, explain. And over the years, I've seen this in many places in my country, in the United States, but also elsewhere. And what we have come to realize is that not only is just the transfer of knowledge not enough,
but telling students things is not even the best way to transfer the knowledge in the first place. What Carol Dweck, last year's EDON uh, laureate, has helped us learn is that actual struggle, when students struggle a bit, it can lead to learning, it can contribute to learning, and in fact may even make a person more intelligent. And along the way, we've also learned that making mistakes can be more powerful than getting right answers sometimes in terms of the learning process. So we often ask the question, how can we help students who struggle? And I'd like to ask what I think is a more important question, which is, how can we help students who don't struggle enough? And I think that's most of them. It's not just students we see as low performers, it's even the students we see as the most advanced that we don't give an opportunity to wrestle with things before we have told them everything we think they need to know in order to solve a problem. So what I am advocating is a fundamental shift in teaching. It all depends on how we organize classrooms. If we can start, it's what I call upside down teaching. Instead of first telling rules and procedures and then giving a problem in which you use exactly the rules you just learned, start with giving students an interesting, engaging problem that they don't know how to solve yet and use their struggles as they wrestle with ideas as a platform for drawing out their thinking, having them share their ideas, discuss with each other, and then the teacher role becomes how do we pull that together as a platform for then learning the intended mathematics that we want. So that's the kind of upside down teaching that I see and what I see is in teachers who have tried this not only in my country but around the world is that we will discover new stars who think about things in new and different ways. Thank you. And Sagata. Well, I, uh, I want to start by saying that, uh, you know, if there's something that you need to know and there is a textbook on it and it exists in the curriculum and there is a trained teacher for it, then there's no problem. We know how to do that. And most of education for the first 17 years of our life were things of that type. They were in the curriculum, there was a test book, there was a trained teacher, etc. However, what happens when you have things which you need to know, but which have appeared so quickly that there is no time to write a textbook, there is no time to put it into the curriculum, and there is nobody who can teach it. Hmm. The number of such things were very small, in the years to come, that number is going to grow to a very large extent. I think that's going to be our big challenge in education. How to enable students to learn things that their teachers do not have the time or the capacity to know themselves. Well, uh, some amazing comments there and some fascinating ideas from engaging the learners to developing teachers, this idea of um, teaching less and learning more, which I think combines those, the idea of struggling, these, this fast-moving issue. Um, we heard yesterday, particularly from Larry Hedges, about the need for evidence. Um, can I just challenge all of you? Um, you say wonderful things. What's the evidence that it actually works? Who, who would like to bravely answer first? Yes. It's really important that if uh, we're going to be doing the right things in education, as everyone's been saying, we've got to be basing it on the best bets we can possibly make. Uh, we conducted a big international review of what do we know about how we actually help teachers teach better. Um, and we base all our work on that. If you look at the work of uh, Professor Matthew Kraft over in the US, he found that there are some teachers in schools with poor environments uh, who plateau. Over 10 years, they can be no better one year than the next, whereas in the teachers who are working in the schools, we got that right environment where they're focusing on how teachers learn. 10 years in that school, they can be helping children learn 40% more every single year and closing the gap for the most disadvantaged. So we have the evidence that focusing on teacher development and the way we lead it can have benefits for everyone. So do feel free to submit some more questions if you'd like to. Anyone else want to respond yeah. on evidence? Well, the yes, in, oh, Dennis the interesting and then thing is if you're innovating, it's tough to measure an innovation by the old measures. You have to have new measures. So what we use, because we do not believe in many of the standardized tests, is we're constantly looking at longitudinal studies. We're looking at not only where our students go after jobs, college, but their happiness with that. And the other piece is that people keep coming back to us and starting more schools around the world. So we take that as positive evidence also. But we're constantly trying to come up with new measures to match the innovation. 
And Kathy. Yes, uh, what we actually know from the work of Carol Dweck and others is that we have, we have scans of brains while people are working on hard math problems. And we actually can see new neural connections being made as students struggle through something that helps them work things out in their mind. And if I can then tap into our two uh, laureates from this year, in fact, uh, a colleague of Carol Dweck's, Joe Bowler, a mathematics educator from the UK working at Stanford University, has conducted some, uh, some MOOCs, uh, online, massive online courses, She's had over 200,000 students participate with a 60, more than 65% participation rate. And there have been published studies that I think would meet uh, Professor Hedge's criteria in terms of seeing that the students who learned about their own growth mindset, about their own mindset about learning and their attitudes about mistakes, these students' uh, mathematics achievement has also improved as well. So we do have all kinds of growing evidence and we look forward to Professor Hedge's collecting it for us. <laughs> Uh, now, you have a, a range of different national backgrounds or areas that you've worked on. Do you all think that your work is applicable everywhere in the world? Mm -hmm. Are there differences culturally or historically that mean that some ideas are going to work in some places and not in others? Anybody want to...? Uh, yes, yeah, right. Well, I mean, I, um, uh, I work with self-organized uh, learning environments for children particularly children under the age of 15, and it works exactly the same way everywhere in the world, and I have actually tried it everywhere in the world. <laughs> everywhere, that's, that's quite a claim. But <laughs> <laughs> I think the importance of what we do when we start schools is that we have a particular design and model, but we don't try to tell the people in the different countries how to run it. So we've been very successful because how they run it in India is different from how they run it in the Netherlands, but they follow our philosophy. And, and that allows us not to push something on a particular country, so. Yeah, okay. I don't have evidence. <laughs> Teach less, learn more is an appeal for better quality teaching, more engaging teaching. Children are little people of some sorts, and they have got radars fitted on them. They switch on the radar, they're looking for something in the horizon of the classroom. They switch the horizon and, and if it goes bing, bing, that is interesting, interesting, that is the teacher, teacher. Then like a homing missile, they'll go straight into what the, teaching, what the teacher is trying to get across. The only thing is that in many parts of the world, including mine, when children switch on their radar, they found that there's nothing, nothing. <laughs> And therefore, if that's the case, what do they do? They create their own focus, much to the displeasure of the teacher. And the teacher say, I have classroom management problems. No, you don't. You have pedagogical problems. <laughs> I don't have evidence. <laughs> but I think that message to teachers will be very helpful to uplift them. A good teacher is like a chef. You just want to produce a much better dish than the one before. With that <laughs> spirit, children will benefit. Um, one of the things that we were chatting about preparing for this was what we should teach. And there's a discussion about 21st century skills or various other phrases. Uh, what, what is it that you think that we should be teaching? Um, I'm hoping we get some disagreement on this at least. Who would like to... Go first. Dave. Okay, listen, I'm going to start with a controversial point. Good, um, I disagree. No. Okay. <laughs> you wait for it, wait for it. Um, so I, 21st century skills are exactly the same skills as we needed in the 20th century and the 19th century. I don't think there's ever been a point where you wouldn't have done better if you had teamwork and curiosity and ingenuity. What I find really concerning is when people say, do you know what, let's teach 21st century skills, let's not teach content. Mm. I'm going to allude to my dance background now. Ah. Imagine we were trying to teach the next generation of ballroom dancers, and we said, listen, I'm not going to teach you dance steps. I'm going to teach you problem solving and ingenuity. Now go out there and enter Dancing with the Stars. It's not going to be pretty. <laughs> if you're going to push the boundaries, you need to know what's in the boundaries already. Michelangelo, Marie Curie, they learned the greatest knowledge first. They stood on the shoulders of giants by learning content, and only then they pushed the boundaries later. And my worry is if we say, no, 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 Google's got content, just teach them 21st century skills, we're forgetting how the brain learns. And if we look at how brains actually learn, you've got to have a map, you've got to have populate your map with ideas, and only then you can push the boundaries. So I'm, I'm not keen on 21st century skills. 
So, Dennis, you said you were going to disagree. So. I couldn't wait till he said that. So, <laughs> it's not an either or, it's an and both. Mm -hmm. Okay? And I believe that information is changing so quickly that we do have, you're right, the 21st century name is not right, but we do have to help students learn how to be creative, how to solve problems, how to use knowledge. You can't do any of that without particular knowledge. But in my schools, it doesn't matter what the knowledge is. If you want to be on the dance show, then you really study the dance, but you're also learning the skills around it. Because what I find, I had a teacher. She was the best teacher in my school. Everyone thought they learned history. They got an A in June. I said, give those kids a test in September. She gave a test. They all flunked. They didn't remember what they learned in June. So we want people to learn to be a historian, to be a mathematician, to think like a scientist, and they'll get the knowledge. Would you like to rebut? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else want to come in on this before I let? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll jump in here because in mathematics, I think we, we often believe that the primary area of mathematics is computation <laughs> and arithmetic. And yet what we have discovered over the years is that that's, that's so limiting that when you have someone who can do all the procedures perfectly, but never know when to use what in a given situation, or even recognize that this situation may call for mathematics. For some years now, we've been recognizing within the profession that it's all about being able to use what you know to solve problems. And certainly, we need content to do that. Our problem in mathematics teaching, frankly, has been way too much emphasis on the computational part and much, uh, uh, not nowhere near enough emphasis on the idea of thinking and reasoning and actually struggling with ideas. And I think the idea that students seeing themselves as mathematics people, they have to see themselves as problem solvers because many of them can't imagine themselves just doing computation or feel like a mistake will get them in trouble. Sugata, Pakti, do you want to wait into this or wait for the next? Just a quick comment, which is that, uh, I mean, I agree more or less about standing on the shoulders of giants. <coughs> for those subjects where there are giants, but if there are no uh. giants, then what do you stand on? Right? <laughs> so, so to give you an example, and I'll just close with that, if you want to make uh, designer babies using CRISPR, what giant shoulders will you stand on? Let's not talk about whether you should do it as well. That's a, <laughs> an entirely different question for now. Um, Pakti, do you want to comment on yeah. this? Uh, I've, all I'm saying is I'm not against 21st century skills. There's a need for it. I'm just saying that we were all born in the 20th century. I just wonder how many of us receive an education in 20th century so that we actually could come to the 21st. <laughs> it's just food for thought. So we're beginning to get some questions coming in, which, which is great. And I'll come to those. But one, one last question, which I'd love to hear your thoughts on briefly again, I'm afraid. What is the point of all of this? What's the purpose of education? Because surely if we don't know that, we can't do it right. Who wants to try to justify education? For me, the education is about the spirits of education. What that means is this. We, technology, definitely we need to talk about that. Policy changes, we need to talk about that. But education is really about paying it forward. That is to say, to me, education is the human enterprise of paying it forward. I think we are people who have benefited from the previous generation. And one of the greatest gifts that we can give to mankind is to pay it forward to the next generation. And therefore, to me, who are educators? I think educators, you and I, we are people who plant trees so that some other people come sit underneath those trees and no one will ever know who planted those trees in the first place. That's who you are. That's who I am. And if we continue to do that with that long-suffering spirit, paying the price of change in this generation, then I'm sure that the next generation will benefit from us and there will be a brighter tomorrow. That, to me, is education. Thank Anyone you. else wants to have a go at education? Kathy. I honestly believe that education lies at the foundation of the solution of every problem in the world, whether it's faced by individuals or communities or nations or the planet. And whether that education is about learning something about another person, about another culture, about the world around us, about the issues, about content and about how we can approach issues related to health and the economy and, and well-being of, of the group in which we are, 
Um, I just think it's, it's the very foundation. And for every government in the world not to prioritize it as number one is holding us all back, I'm afraid, and, and, um, and, and making many, many people disadvantaged in their own world. Yeah. So we've had spirits and solutions. Dennis, Well, you to me, it's a lot about equity. It's about hope. Um, which combines with all that. And mm -hmm. That's our obligation for our world. Yes. So, yes sir. I have a, just a very uh, short definition for education. I think education is an attempt to produce happy, healthy, and useful people. Hmm. I agree. Fantastic. Yes, David. Uh, so I would say there's something that the, uh, the, the Greeks and the, the Romans used to understand, um, this trivium, that you inherit the past, you understand the present, and then you can create the future using that. And there's something about equity, but there's also something that education frees us from conformity and oppression yeah. as well. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that freedom from, from uh, ignorance is quite a powerful concept. Um, let's move to some of the questions we've had from the audience. Um, well, let's take this one first. Uh, how, sh how soon should children be exposed to iPads and smartphones? <laughs> Anyone want to give the definitive answer once and for all? <laughs> Pakti's nominated but, you, uh, Kathy. <laughs> no, I think Sugata. Sugata. <laughs> well, I've, I've, I've been pushing it down, and uh, my current uh, estimate is one year. One. Okay, so you think before one, it's just not worth it. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe if you, they could use it to swat flies or something. <laughs> <laughs> any, any advances on one-year-olds? Everyone's happy with that? If you, the only thing I would say is it's really fascinating. You look at Silicon Valley bosses, and even though they're the people pushing these technologies, for yeah. some reason, they're not letting their children get onto it till their mid-teens. So uh, there's something very curious that the medicine they want for everyone else is not the medicine they choose <laughs> for their own children. So I, for me, it just raises some interesting questions. Anyone else want to chip in on this? Uh, yes, just that uh, my schools and I think life needs to be about high touch, but also high tech because it's out there. So it's that balance and the same way people used to uh, work with television the same way how you control it in some way yeah. Well, I, my, my take on this uh, thing about Silicon Valley is I, I, I don't think there's any Conspiracy theory there about why they're not allowing their children to use iPads I think it's much simpler than that the people who are taking that decision Think that they know as much education as they know their technology and that's a mistake yeah. Okay um, moving on then to another question from the audience. I'm always keen to get some audience involvement. Um, there's one here about pace. So it says governments are very slow moving machines. So the, by the time there are new processes or approaches in place, they're already outdated. And the question actually says, ca how can we take education for teachers outside the government so it's prompt? You may not think that's the right answer, but how do we make sure that the whole system is fast enough? I mean, this is what you've been talking about, Zagas. I don't know if you want to say anything more. Yeah, sure. I mean, th there's a very simple way to do it. If you want uh, children to learn, I'm, I'm not going to use the word teach. If you want children to learn a subject where you don't have the, the system doesn't have the time required for the teacher to prepare, then there's only one way. The teacher has to be up there. The teacher has to be the network. David. A reflection, uh, the most powerful moment for me as a teacher was the moment uh, seven years into my teaching career where I joined Twitter. And my mind was absolutely blown by suddenly being connected to an international community of educators, seeing this knowledge whiz around in ways that it was freed up from any government systems. What governments don't tend to invest in enough is the interconnectivity between teachers. And knowledge gets stuck in certain schools or in certain clusters. And if we can ensure that the best practice can spread around, whether through technology or ensuring teachers have the time to meet with each other and talk to each other, that's the only way we're going to make sure that the best ideas can move around quick enough. We can't possibly wait for them to get spotted, filtered to the top, get put into textbooks, and then gradually filter down. It's the connectivity for teachers is going to change education. Yeah. Dennis, you're I mean, I think uh, the government's losing control. They may not know it because so much learning is going on on Twitter and other places outside that school building. So that's, I think, a very big positive move of where education is going to go, and it won't be under as tight a control in the years to come. Well, I'd love to think that 
for me, the solution would be to take education out, out of politicians' point of view and let everybody else do it correctly, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> Speaking as a politician, I have some <laughs> concerns with that, but <laughs> I think there are some, some, some genuine value questions there. But can I also just ask, though, because there's been a lot of comment about the information being out in the cloud or on Twitter, how do you verify that any of it is accurate? It is a reasonable uh, assumption that a textbook has been checked by somebody. Mm -hmm. It's less true that something on Twitter has been checked by somebody. Actually, that's not true. I think information on the internet, by and large, except for politics and religion, is actually not only checked, it's checked by billions of people. So if you put in something wrong, right below that, there'll be an enormous list telling you what's wrong with it. Well, I, I'd like to disagree with that just a little bit because what I find in the United States is we often talk about curriculum by Pinterest in which teachers just share ideas randomly and some of those ideas are in fact dangerous even getting in the way of it. like teaching a shortcut that I just saw the other day which was called the sleepy mouse for how you know how to multiply and divide positive and negative numbers. And it was pretty terrifying because a student trying to remember the mouse has no concept, uh, tends to have no concept of the numbers underneath it. And so I worry that, that materials and information that's just out there, that teachers who are so inundated don't have time to filter it. And I would also suggest that when we do take the time to go through and justify and get, gather the evidence that's why it takes longer. That's why we're not so nimble sometimes, I'm afraid. And I'm not sure there's a really good way to get past that. I don't see one yet. And this is uh, another argument for skills, whatever you call them, is that we do exercises to help our students learn how to differentiate. Yes. How to read something, an event happened, how to read a conservative paper or uh, something online versus a progressive. How do they decide? Because mm -hmm. that's the question. Because there's so many views out there, and we got to teach our students to go deeper and know what's fake news and what's not fake news. Yeah. One of the things when I'm working with uh, school principals, I always tell them, you know that moment where you read a book or you read a blog or you read a paper and you get really excited about it? That's the moment. ding a ling a ling a ling that's the moment the klaxon goes off. And you go, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm excited. I've lost my criticality. I need to go back and then Google it and search for criticism and evidence and go check. The trouble with the internet, it magnifies the best and the worst. Mm -hmm. It magnifies your ability to be critical and find information, but it also magnifies your ability to find like-minded people who will agree with you, no matter how good or bad your idea. And unfortunately, there are groups of educators with really outdated, non-evidence-based ideas, all agreeing with each other and finding evidence that confirms their view. It amplifies the best and the worst, just like politics. <laughs> and it does tell us something, at least to me. Now, I'm biased because I'm a teacher. So in the world of robots, where a lot of things will be by robots and internet, I think the human teacher will be more important than ever before because there's something quite human about love, about trust, about discernment. I think these are some of these human qualities that are so important. And so a lot of things could be taken over by the internet, a lot of things taken over by robots. Education, the very nature of it may change but there's something still very human about learning. Yes, and yes. let teachers focus on those. Human teachers, in my opinion, will be more important than ever before. Yes. So that actually yes. brings me to one of the questions which came in from the audience um, about particularly highly self-driven education. How do you couple that with mentoring? How do you couple that with the other roles that a teacher traditionally has had, which isn't just about delivering content? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to... Yeah, Give well, your view well, on that, I, I, I'll make a very small uh, uh, definitional change, which is that when I say self-learning, it's not about one child learning by himself or herself. Mm. Okay, what I've noticed over the last 20 years is that you need groups. Mm -hmm. You need groups of children. The mentoring is done by the groups. Mm. The detection of false information is done by the groups. Mm. If you allow the groups to interact with each other, then several groups of eight-year-olds can think better than a trained adult teacher. Yeah? I guess what we've got to be careful of is as soon as you have self-directed learning, then one of the things we find is that the children with the most resources and who already have the most confidence are the ones who can take the most use of them. 
and the children who are struggling and have less confidence and fewer resources and less support from parents at home are the ones who will struggle even more when they have less in human interaction. So again, it amplifies some of these changes. So what we need to do is then we balance the human elements and we need to say to the children who have less resource and less resilience and less confidence, how can I support you and help you to make the most of this self-directed learning? Because if we don't do that, my worry is technology is going to make inequality worse and not better. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So I've changed the name of teachers in my school to advisors. Mm -hmm. And then every student has a mentor also, which is a student mentor, an adult mentor out in the community. And so we try to do what you're talking about so that um, students don't move from class to class. But this advisor, certified teacher, follows them for four years and helps move them get the right mentors and move them on. And again, like Bhakti talked about, it's about the learning, not about the teaching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, to take an extreme case, are we saying that there's one scenario where we just need fewer teachers because technology replaces them all, and there's another where we need just as many, but they don't do any of the teaching? It, it, are those the two options we're talking about here? No. <laughs> so I just, so I, just, I don't think I, either of those two, actually. Um, personally, I think we, we've, we've evolved to learn by observing people doing an expert job, copying it, getting feedback, and also listening to stories. That's a deeply human act. I think we need really expert teachers who are, yes, not only facilitating, but also telling these stories and demonstrating their expertise and allowing children to have access and watch these rich experts among them, and not just people who say, no, no, I don't know the stuff. You figure it out yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think we need even more teachers, even better trained, even better at facilitating, as well as just great, fantastic quality teaching. Yes. And, and Sagata, what would you say about the number of teachers we'll actually need? I, I think we'll need just as many teachers in both systems as you will, it, it, as, as uh, uh, you know, in, in both uh, kinds of learning. So it's not as though self-organized learning environments will not need teachers, but their role is different. Their role is not even that of an advisor, not a guide, not a supervisor, definitely. I would put the role as the teacher says to the, to the class, you go there, I'll go with you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to come in on this before? No, also, we're beginning to run out of time, but we've just got enough time left for all of the panel to condense all of their wisdom, knowledge, thoughts, and understanding <laughs> into one very brief final thought. So the, these are the messages that they want you to remember. I mean, I'm sure they hope you remember all the rest of it, but this is the bit you should listen to. Uh, Sigata, can I pick up on you and go first? We'll go down that way. One line now. One line, one key thing. Okay, <laughs> let me, let, let me uh, attempt it. Uh, if I had to say what we as educators should know about learning for the future, my one-liner would be, we're headed into a world where you need to know when you need to know. Very profound. Kathy? Well, my request to all of you as we think about what actions to take forward from here is, whether you're at a, a business level, political level, uh, work in schools or whatever, Invest in teachers, whether it's the teacher that's humanly in front of a group of students or virtually in front of students by distance learning. When we invest in teachers and help them deepen their own content understanding, as well as learning different ways of structuring their classroom so that they can create classrooms, those upside down classrooms, where we have students thinking and interacting with each other, that's the kind of investment we need in teachers to help them make that shift. So teachers say we should invest in teachers, okay. <laughs> Fakti. In a world where change is the only constant, perhaps one real change in education is to look for constants that should not change. These fundamental values, the things that we treasure most, the love, the care, the trust, the commitment, I think these things are the bedrocks, the beacons that will help us navigate the turbulent waters of change so that we educators will not be lost, but will always be people who will affect the future of mankind. That is what I see teachers as. David. So I would say if every single person in this room focused their efforts on transforming the, the learning of one child, you've changed one life. If every person in this room trans, uh, focused their efforts on transforming the learning of one teacher, you've transformed 100 lives. Let's focus our innovation, our technology, on helping teachers learn as much or even more that we focus on helping children learn. Yeah. Dennis, and finally I, over I to you. I would follow David uh, about we need great leadership. 
and principals, directors of schools, if they can become great leaders, they help their teachers become great leaders. And the real piece is that we need to stop tweaking around the edges. We need to be bold. I sometimes say, if we're not standing on the edge, we're taking up too much space. It's time to really move forward and reimagine and reinvent what we're doing. Well, thank you all very much. I'm afraid that really is all we have time for. It's a, a rather short slot for so many people with so many interesting things. But I think we've covered a lot of material from how we use technology, how we make the most of that, particularly where there are new skills and new things that we need to learn, to how we get teachers doing a more high-level job, to being freed to actually do the mentorship roles that they should do. Had a bit of a debate about 21st century skills, but both of you survived, so I think that's all right, and um, you're clearly best of friends now, um, and how we should really challenge people. So thank you all very, very much. Thanks thank to you. all of you for listening. Enjoy the rest of the day.